fact is we all learned in the last couple of years that change, we're all told that organizations can't change, hate change. Change is actually quite easy in a true moment of crisis. Right? So many organizations were able to dramatically change their operating models, everything they did in a matter of days and weeks. My last book was The Digital Transformation Playbook. Uh, this was the first book written on the topic of digital transformation uh, and defined the field, the subject, by arguing that digital transformation is actually not about technology. Uh, it is much more about strategy, uh, leadership, and new ways of thinking inside our organizations. Uh, so what have I learned uh, in those years since? Well, the biggest thing I learned is that digital transformation is quite hard. <laughs> uh, even if you do manage to rethink your strategy, to drive change in large, established, complex organizations is extraordinarily hard. Uh, and I'm not the only one who's learned this uh, in the intervening years. Every major uh, international consulting firm has done some kind of study on the subject of digital transformation, and they've all pretty much come up with the same finding, which is that roughly 70% of companies who are even attempting and investing in and really pursuing a digital transformation are failing by their own measure, by their own estimate. Um, and that's a sobering fact that we have to deal with. Uh, frankly, this is not sustainable. And it's not sustainable because the world is not slowing down. Right. The need for change is not going to go away. Uh, uh, the digital revolution is not stabilizing and hitting a plateau. So we have to get better at driving change in organizations. Uh, now, there are a million things that can go wrong and that do go wrong in the course of trying to drive digital change in established businesses. My own research has focused on trying to understand, out of all the many symptoms we can see in organizations, what are the underlying root causes? What are the root causes of failure? And what I found in my research is there's really five essential barriers to digital transformation. The first is a lack of a shared vision. A shared vision of why that particular organization much, must change. I see so many organizations where they talk about a digital transformation and all their language is generic. Right. We need to be digital. We want to be digital first. We want to future-proof our organization. And they are inevitably using very generic metrics and goals to define their progress. Things like maturity metrics that are pulled off the shelf from a consultant and used for every business they, they meet with. Uh, the second barrier is I see a lack of growth priorities guiding digital transformation efforts. So we either see companies where there's really no focus strategy, and so you just have a lot of scattered digital projects going in different directions. Or I also see companies where digital is seen purely as an effort towards cost cutting. Right? No view of how do we actually drive growth and new opportunities in our business. Uh, the third barrier is a lack of experimentation. Companies are still sticking with their old habits of dealing with change through planning, more planning. More planning, give me benchmarks, show me the case study, the business case, bring in third party data, tell us what we can do because it's been proven many, many times before. That does not work in this context. The fourth barrier is a lack of flexibility in the governance of these organizations. They're applying the same BAU, business as usual, processes and management to new opportunities that they have applied for years to their established business. And lastly, I see companies struggling with, they want to change, and yet they are still have the same technology stack, they still have the same uh, talent and skill set, they still have the same culture inside the organization that they had before the digital era. So to make digital transformation really work, it's not enough to rethink your strategy. We also have to transform the organization. That is the subject of my new book, The Digital Transformation Roadmap. And in it, I lay out five steps that any organization can, ta can take to drive real meaningful change and to become a much more adaptive 
organization that can respond to change moving forward in the world. Right? This is a blueprint, if you will, for any organization. And let me just spend the time we have today together to give you a brief introduction to each of these five steps and what they mean for your organizations. The first step is to define a shared vision. And this is critical. The fact is we all learned in the last couple of years that change, we're all told that organizations can't change, hate change. Change is actually quite easy in a true moment of crisis. Right? So many organizations were able to dramatically change their operating models, everything they did in a matter of days and weeks in March of 2020. But most of the time, thankfully, we are not at that level of true uh, existential crisis. And when you are not in that circumstance, transformation is quite hard. Right? How do you motivate? How do you align? How do you get people out of their habits and out of their sort of foxholes to actually be ready to step forward and do something different? And this starts with the imperative to have a shared vision. right? And this has to be a vision everyone understands and that is also unique to your particular organization. This is an answer to the questions, where is our world going as a business? What role will we play in that future landscape? And why? Why must it be us? In my work, I found four critical components of an effective shared vision. You need this future landscape vision. You need to understand your unique right to win. And you need to be able to define the case for change, both in terms of the impact you're going to have on the world and in terms of the business results that you are expecting to receive back. Today, Disney is guided in the digital era by a different business theory. It's one based on Disney taking its unique intellectual property, characters, storytelling, and becoming much more of a direct-to-consumer company, a business that actually has an individual relationship and a connection to each person who it serves. Of course, streaming, its streaming services are at the heart of it, but this vision is also about how those connect to all the other parts of the business. The second step of the roadmap is we have to pick our strategic priorities to define and guide our digital transformation. I call this picking the problems that matter most. Now here we get into trouble in the era of so much digital change. The problem is the technology can become an incredible distraction. Right? It is constantly drawing our attention away from questions of strategy. I keep having to talk to companies and tell them, you do not have an AI strategy, let alone a chat GPT strategy, right? You do not have a metaverse strategy or a blockchain strategy. These are technologies that you may use in order to pursue certain opportunities to create value in the market, but these are not the starting point of strategy. So we have to constantly force ourselves to keep shifting our view, shifting our minds from focusing on the latest new products and shiny objects, and instead focusing back on customer needs. Right. As digital native businesses and entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley are, uh, uh, love to say, you have to fall in love with the problem, not the solution. So MasterCard, for example, long known as a credit card uh, network, is reinventing itself as the world's biggest fintech company. And they are doing that by focusing on strategic opportunities in the digital era, such as how can MasterCard solve the cybersecurity needs of businesses and institutions today using things like digital identity authentication? How can they harness the vast amounts of retail transactional data which flow through their network every day? How can you harness that data for new analytics and insights to solve a wide range of business and social problems? How can they provide financial inclusion to underserved and unbanked communities around the world using the latest technologies and business models of the digital era? Uh, one of the tools, there are actually eight tools in the book. And one of them is the problem opportunity matrix. And this is designed to help any organization find and pick what are the most important problems and opportunities that truly matter to your customers and to your business. 
The third step of the roadmap is experimentation. Now, this is where we have to really learn and adopt the lessons of agile and lean startup and design thinking and product management so that we become comfortable constantly experimenting, rapidly testing and validating new ventures to find out which ones will work in the real world. This starts with a mindset, and that is a leadership mindset from the top all the way to the bottom of humility. Right? I love this quote from Dean Baquet. When he was at the New York Times talking about their digital transformation, he was brutally honest. He said, we have no idea what is going to work, what the future of journalism is going to look like. Right? When we started podcasts, we had no idea. We take risks, we screw up, we try stuff. We don't know what's going to stick. This mindset is critical. Now, once you adopt that mindset, of course, you start to realize all the things you don't know. The incredible amount of uncertainty around any new digital business model or venture which you're planning or thinking about launching in the world. So how do you go about actually answering all these questions, testing all these many hypotheses and business assumptions that you're making? Well, I've developed a model called the four stages of validation, which simply helps to organize and guide any business and any venture through this process of validation. Right? So you have to validate first, what is the problem that you think you are solving? Second, what's the solution that you believe will address it? Third, what is the product that you think the customer will actually use? And fourth, what is the business that you think you can build off of that? Right? Now, what does this look like in practice? It really comes down to, do you adopt this kind of approach to testing and validating and learning, challenging all your assumptions about your business? Or do you sort of take the old playbook, which is a lot of planning and a big decision by a leader at the top? So let me give you two contrasting examples. The first, CNN. Not long ago, uh, the leadership of CNN and its parent, Warner Brothers, had a very exciting idea for a new digital business model. They saw the whole world is going to streaming. They saw the great success of Disney Plus and others. And they said, this could be an opportunity for news, for our brand, for our kind of content, and to reach audiences in the digital era in a different way. Very exciting idea, right? So what did they do? Did they, they experiment, they validate, did they test and learn what the customers really wanted? No. <laughs> they created a long, very detailed plan, right? Hired McKinsey, got a lot of third-party data, convinced themselves there was no question, this was a huge opportunity, just waiting for them to walk through the door. It was all just a matter of execution. And so they put $300 million into preparing for the launch of CNN Plus. That was all before day one, spent. And so they launched the service exactly as they envisioned and were quite certain that the customers would want and love it to be. And it was not what they expected. Uh, less than 10,000 daily users. Uh, uh, a tremendous failure by their own expectations and their own standards. And the whole thing, CNN Plus, was shut down uh, in about a month. Now, it was a really interesting idea. I, I do not uh, dis uh, discredit that at all. Uh, but the fact is, $300 million was a lot of money, a huge waste of money to learn whether or not the market demand was exactly what they had predicted beforehand. By contrast, let's look at Walmart. Now, one of the big strategic priorities of Walmart in recent years has been, can they be the ones who really help to define the future of online grocery purchase? Right? A really critical, important category in commerce, which had not yet been really sort of uh, captured in the shift to e-commerce and omni-channel uh, purchasing and delivery. And so as they focused on this, they didn't create a giant master plan and roll it out. They said, there are many different ways we might approach this. We don't know what's going to work. Right? I was at Walmart Labs talking with their chief operating officer, Jeff Schatz, when they were running constant experiments, checking pricing, checking customer demand, different types of basket sizes, operational questions. 
And what they found iteratively through testing different approaches was there were many opportunities that might work. Most important, uh, they discovered uh, there were some customers who would pay per delivery, but there was a lot of value in creating what they launched, Walmart Plus, a membership program, annual membership, a little bit like uh, Amazon Prime, that would give you free grocery delivery for the entire year, uh, as well as some additional benefits at the physical stores of Walmart. Um, at the same time, they also tested a BOPS, buy online, pick up at store uh, uh, model, and they had that in play when the pandemic hit. And suddenly, there was a huge surge in demand for that. Now, this was free. You didn't have to sign up for the membership. Anyone could order online. Uh, you just had to drive to the store, and they would come out and put the food, the groceries, in the back of your car, in the trunk. And this became extremely popular. But of course, customer demands, needs, or expectations are shifting. More recently, as quarantines have lifted and lives have changed, uh, Walmart discovered a new emerging customer need. Some of the customers don't just want to have you bring the groceries and leave them at your doorstep where the ice cream and the sorbet and other things can start to melt. Uh, they actually want to have a known, trusted Walmart employee, who they know by name, to actually come into their home and put it all away for them. And thus, they've launched Walmart in-home, a new variation, a premium version of the same service. Always testing, always learning, what does the customer need? What will actually work in the real world? The fourth step of the roadmap is about governance. And governance encompasses many things. It is oversight of new ventures like we've been talking about. It's funding, it's people. Where do people get assigned uh, to uh, new opportunities? It's metrics, it's compliance, right? All of these things are critical for any established business. And yet, if we don't get out of our own way, if we simply use the old governance we've run for years, as the company is trying to change, it will continually put barriers to innovation in front of us. And so we have to learn to rethink governance to really empower us to manage new growth at scale. And this is critical. If you look at the success of the New York Times and transforming its business model, it's not just about how they've changed the whole process around news gathering and creating stories and distributing them and the subscription model around news. It's also been supported critically by new revenue streams from things like New York Times cooking, uh, the New York Times gaming app. These are separate subscriptions, uh, acquisitions like uh, not just you know, Wordle, but the wire cutter, the athletic, and how each of these are actually managed with different governance models based on what they need to succeed. Right? And Amazon, you may not know, but the most profitable part of that entire business by far is not the e-commerce service and Prime that we're also personally familiar with. It's actually Amazon Web Services. This was a huge step outside the core of the business back in the day when they were purely a retail uh, company. It was actually a junior engineer named Benjamin Black who first sketched out in a white paper this idea that, hey, if we are rebuilding our entire technology stack to have a more scalable e-commerce operation, maybe that's something that we could also sell as a service, enterprise cloud computing services, right? A huge step uh, for Amazon. And this the story points to something that digital native businesses truly understand, which is the importance of pushing decision-making down the organizational chart to the lowest level. This is part of the whole idea of two pizza teams at Amazon, which have been adopted in other businesses as well. And the key here is to design your governance to empower your teams to drive change. Right? And these are teams that are going to look very different than the kinds of sort of siloed functional teams you have in most traditional organizations. These teams are small, they are multifunctional, they are critically single-threaded. That means everyone is 100% focused on the single project or venture that they are fo focusing on and working on right now. Uh, they are autonomous. They have clear decision rights so that they can work without constantly needing to get sign-off outside approval on the decisions they make. And they are accountable, which starts with a clear definition of success for that team and its work to which they can be held accountable and transparent metrics that everyone can see what is happening while they are working independently. A very different model of governance for teams. The last step of the roadmap is capabilities. 
How do we grow the technology, talent, and culture that we need to truly be a digital business? Now, Volkswagen, like many of its peers, established automobile companies, are all grappling with a question right now. Am I a car company, or am I a tech company that makes cars? Because right? guess what? <laughs> That's what Tesla is. Right? It is a very different kind of company. And this is a question that each of us has to be grappling with. Are you a tech company in your own field? And that really comes down to three things. First of all, do you have the right kind of digital technology? Architecture, data assets, IT governance, which are all designed for flexibility, for scale, for agility, for independence of action throughout the organization. Do you have the right digital talent? This has to be managed not just at a point of hiring people, but really throughout the entire talent life cycle if you're going to have and grow the talent that you need. And third, you have to have a digital-ready culture. You need a culture that is data-driven, that is collaborative, risk-taking, experimenting, that is much more bottom-up than just top-down command and control, one that is focused not on the products but obsessed with your customers. Right? Now, if you spend time with great digital native businesses, you'll actually find they talk much more about culture than about their technology. At Amazon, they are constantly looking to their clearly defined leadership principles and asking, what are the processes that we can use every day to support and instill, make those principles really come to life? Right? My friend, uh, David Glick was at Amazon for almost 20 years, from the IPO days to the, the current era. And he saw more and more of these develop over time as Amazon thought about how do we instill culture at scale. One of the many things that he saw uh, added was the no PowerPoint rule. Right? So if you're in a meeting at Amazon, you are not allowed to present your proposal and your ideas in a PowerPoint. Instead, you have to use a six-page memo, which carefully lays out in narrative fashion, following a, a very rough template of the topics, what you're proposing and why, presenting data both in favor of your argument and against your argument, taking that critical point of view. And then at the start of every meeting, everyone sits in total silence while they read the memo. Because they learn from experience. If you send the memo in advance, some people are going to read it, a lot won't because they're busy, and they'll just kind of bluff their way through the meeting and pretend they have. So everyone sits at the first start of the meeting, reads the whole memo, takes notes. Once everyone's done and ready and has their questions, then the discussion begins. Why do they do this? Because it changes how decisions are made. And that is critical to how Amazon operates. It's critical to their culture. So these are the five steps of the roadmap. And in the book, there are actually a number of uh, specific concepts and strategic planning tools within each of these steps to help you to define a shared vision in your organization, to pick the problems that matter most, to validate new ventures that you are focused on, to manage growth at scale with your governance, and to grow the technology, talent, and culture uh, that you need. I want to leave you with three last truths about digital transformation. First, digital transformation is not about technology. It is about business, and it's about the customer. Second, digital transformation cannot just happen top down, command and control from the CEO or the chief digital officer telling everyone else what they're supposed to do. It must be a bottom up change that engages people at every level of the organization. And lastly, digital transformation is not a project. It does not have a start date and an end date. It is a continuous journey. This is because the world is not slowing down. The change is not over. It is going to keep coming. And digital transformation is an ongoing process of becoming an organization that is more and more able to adapt to that change every single day into the future. Digital transformation is hard. I want to be clear, this is not easy for any established business, but it absolutely is possible. In any organization, if you are able to define a shared vision, 
Pick the strategic priorities that matter most to you to really practice experimentation every day in your teams, to reshape your governance, to empower change in the organization, and grow the capabilities and the culture that you need for the future, then any organization can transform and thrive in the digital age. Thank you.